Stephen, what the hell are we wearing? I don't know. She said I needed a suit. Yeah, the ceremonial armor from Conscious Temple, not Psycho Colonel Sanders. Welcome back, everyone. This will be my full Marvel Moon Knight Episode 2 video. There are a whole bunch of Easter eggs to break down. So if you're brand new to the channel, I'm doing videos for all the episodes. Be sure to subscribe to get everything. We're doing a giveaway for Disney Plus memberships, too. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and just leave your favorite moment from the episode on the video. And careful for spoilers if you have not seen Moon Knight Episode 2 yet. We'll just start at the beginning and talk about WTF moments and Easter eggs as we go along. Starting with the episode title, it was called Summon the Suit, which is a reference to Layla yelling at him in Stephen Grant form to summon the Moon Knight costume after she starts to learn what's going on with Stephen Grant, not totally believing what's going on yet. She'll eventually learn more about the multiple personalities soon. And it's a funny reference to him being in Stephen Grant form when he actually makes the change summoning the suit kind of unconsciously as he falls out the window, but it winds up being the Mr. Knight suit from the comics with the actual suit and tie because he's still in Stephen Grant form. And the way they explain it on the TV show, the way they're doing this, is that they're saying that the form that the suit takes is actually based on the way you think. So when he's in full traditional Moon Knight form, he's in Mark Spector form, but because Stephen Grant's mind works so differently, when he summons a suit, it's based on what Stephen Grant is thinking his suit looks like. The difference in the comics is that when he takes the Mr. Knight persona, he's still in Mark Spector form. He's still Moon Knight, but it's when he's working with the police being the world's greatest detective form of Moon Knight. Typically in the comics, when he's in Mr. Knight form wearing the suit and someone attacks him or gets into a big fight, he would just switch back into the normal Moon Knight costume. But the way they're doing it on the TV show, he still has access to Moon Knight's powers and his weapons. Like he pulls the poles out of his back when he's in Stephen Grant form, not totally sure what's going on. The actual opening scene is them picking up right after the events of him beating up the jackals in Mark Spector Moon Knight form inside his apartment in Stephen Grant form after another time jump has gone by, just like we've seen in the previous episode. Although this time, because he remembers everything that happened, he knows about Mark Spector now inside his head. He tries to contact him again in the mirror. When the security guard calls him Scotty by a different name, that's meant to be another reference to all the different identities in the comics. None of them was named Scotty, but it's just a reference to him not understanding who he's speaking to at any given moment, which is something very common in the comics. Like, are you talking to Stephen Grant? Are you talking to Mark Spector? Who knows? The way they explain it later, too, is that when he's running from the Jackal, the reason why the camera glitches and you can't see the Jackal is because normal people who aren't avatars of gods of this pantheon, the Ennead, can't see the creations that come from their pocket dimension. Like they show Layla watching the Jackal fight, but it looks like it's invisible to her. Most of you probably understand the reason why there's no security cam footage of him in Moon Knight Mark Spector form wearing the costume is because it's really, really illegal to videotape people inside the bathrooms for very obvious reasons. When he's talking to the security chief after the fact about how they're not going to file charges, there's all kinds of references to his different personalities. He's sitting between two different lamps, a reference to both Mark Spector and Stephen Grant. The security chief also reveals that he's probably part of this cult that Arthur Harrow leads. That's what the pamphlet is about that he slides out to him, just kind of implying that the security guard, all these other regular members of society are part of this in some way. They've kind of infiltrated all aspects of life, kind of like a Hail Hydra type of twist, like we are amongst you all over the place and you don't realize it. They also reference this when the police come to investigate him too for the quote unquote missing item that he stole. The security chief also tries to get the scarab back from him, although he's kind of nice in the way that he talks about it. It's still a little bit sinister, like, are you sure you didn't steal anything from the museum? Talking about the scarab, but then it's revealed Mark Spector hid it back in his locker, so obviously he doesn't have it on him here. Then causing the security chief to point to his name tag, just saying like, okay, leave that here. Just another reference to him embracing the Mark Spector personality more during this episode, even though they are still kind of fighting each other inside his head. As he leaves, it shows Mark Spector staring back at him in the reflection on the desk. Pretty much any time he passes by any kind of reflective surface in the episode, you always see one of the different personalities. It's not really till the end of the episode, though, that they switch things up, and it's Mark Spector in the body speaking to Stephen Grant inside the reflection. He talks to that same street performer again dressed in gold, and he actually looks at him when he tries to hug him, so I keep wondering if this character is going to turn into something bigger in later episodes. He eventually finds Mark Spector's storage locker the facility belongs to, and when he talks to the security guard, he says that it's number 43. That's a reference to Werewolf by Night number 43, which was the last issue of the Werewolf by Night comic, who's supposed to have some sort of appearance at the end of this series, setting up his big Halloween special later this year. The Moon Knight character debuted for the first time in a Werewolf by Night story. I didn't try scanning the QR code on the locker here with my phone, so if anyone was able to actually get any new Easter eggs from this QR code, post them in the comments below. Sometimes Marvel will do things like that, just like add little QR Easter eggs in the background. 
We've seen most of the footage in the storage locker and all the trailers so far. It's all of Mark Spector's stuff as a mercenary. All of his weapons, his spare gear, his spare passports. The whole idea is that before he died and became Conchu's avatar, he had been a mercenary. When he pulls up the United States passport though, Mark Spector's birthday on it is the exact same day as Oscar Isaac's birthday in real life, but the year 1987 is a reference to the year that Marvel put Moon Knight on the West Coast Avengers team. It's also meant to be a reference to Oscar Isaac's Moon Knight character crossing over with Avengers 5 in the next Avengers team. Also, a lot of the characters they've been introducing in Marvel Phase 4, like the brand new ones like Shang-Chi, for instance, are coming from the West Coast, and a lot of the Marvel Phase 4 series are referencing West Coast Avengers Easter eggs. Also, very important detail here too, zoom and enhance, United States passports get renewed every 10 years. This is due for renewal December 2028, meaning that he got this one after the snap in Avengers Infinity War, meaning that Mark Spector survived the snap, for those of you that are wondering. Stephen Grant starts pawing through all of his stuff, learning about the missions to Egypt, some of the recent history in his life, the Scarab Beetle. The reason why it animates and flies around is because it's meant to work like a supernatural god tier compass, leading them to Amit's physical remains. So the whole idea is that Arthur Harrow wants to bring her physically into the MCU. She's currently trapped in this other dimension with Khonshu and the rest of his pantheon. They're not really able to physically change and interact with the MCU that much until they physically enter it themselves. And the way that Arthur Harrow plans to do that, to bring her into the MCU again, is to find her physical remains, like the bones of her physical body, and then bring her back through some ceremony using those. The thing is, is you could actually do the exact same thing with Khonshu. You could physically bring Khonshu into the MCU if you were able to find his bones. Then Mark Spector shows up and we get to see the personalities arguing with each other, which is a big thing from the comics. This happens all the time in the comics, and it happens many times throughout the episode too, with both of them yelling at each other. One of the big arcs during the series is them reconciling with each other and recognizing that each of them need each of the personalities to survive. He also makes a joke about Mark Spector being super handsome, even though they are literally the same person. Mark Spector also talks about Moon Knight and the god Khonshu out loud for the first time. Of course, it takes Stephen Grant seeing Khonshu himself to start believing it, but he still doesn't totally believe it till later in the episode when he actually sees the suit manifest around him. When he says they protect the vulnerable and deliver Khonshu's justice to those who hurt them, it's a reference to him being called the Fist of Khonshu in the comics, which Arthur Harrow mentions later in the episode after he reveals that he used to be Khonshu's previous avatar before Mark Spector. He keeps talking about the vengeance of Khonshu, the fist of Khonshu. It's a reference to Khonshu being the MCU god of vengeance in addition to him being the Egyptian god of the moon. After Khonshu tries to show up and tell him what's what, he runs away again, this time running straight into Layla who's trying to find his cell phone signal. You do see stuff start to move around when Khonshu gets really pissed, and they kind of clarify this later in the episode, is another example of his limited ability to interact with the physical MCU while he's trapped in some other dimension. The whole idea with Layla, as they explain, is that she doesn't really know anything about what's going on with Steven Grant yet, but she did know that he died and became Moon Knight, the avatar of Khonshu, because she keeps telling him through the episode to summon the suit, so to speak. When they reference him disappearing two months ago and sending her divorce papers trying to keep her safe by pushing her away, it sounds like what happened is, is they got into a fight with Arthur Harrow's men and that's how he died, but then because of what Khonshu was doing to his mind, trying to take over his body physically, it caused him to lose control between the different personalities and that's why the Stephen Grant persona was able to get out. But also on the side, Mark Spector has been trying to not contact Layla and hide from her just to protect her from Khonshu. Because as we learn, if something happens to Mark Spector, he dies a second time, or he decides to sever his deal with Khonshu, like Arthur Harrow did, being his former avatar, then Khonshu has already selected Layla as his next potential avatar. Layla is a brand new character that they created for the series, but she's meant to be a combination of a couple of characters from classic Moon Knight's backstory. In the series, she's already explained to be Mark Spector's wife, like she's been his wife for a while now. I believe she's meant to be just a combination of the Marlene love interest character and her father who's an archaeologist. That's why when she's talking to Stephen Grant she understands the book's Egyptian hieroglyphics. In the comics, Mark Spector wound up dying protecting Marlene and her father from the mercenary Bushmen trying to pilfer the ruins of Khonshu's tomb. As he lay dead at the feet of the statue, Khonshu then used that opportunity to make him his avatar. Later in the comics, they also explained that Khonshu had been targeting Mark Spector his entire life and just kind of waiting for the right opportunity. They reference that later in the episode too when they talk about his history of mental health and how he'd always had this alternate personality that he kept buried within him, but now it's a problem because of what happened with Khonshu. And they'll probably say that he initially died the first time, becoming Khonshu's avatar when he was fighting Arthur Harrow's men. 
She yells about his bad English accent, which is just a reference to the audience yelling at Oscar Isaac's bad English accent. Remember, it's meant to be fake, like it's a creation of his mind. As Steven goes back and forth with Layla, she tries to figure out what's going on. Mark Spector keeps yelling at him in all the different reflections around the room about not telling her what's going on to protect her. He also tells her that this is his mother's flat, the person that he keeps calling, who seemed like she was fake, but then Layla says, oh, you made up with your mother. So apparently Mark Spector had problems with his real life mother, but I think part of the idea is that the number that Steven keeps calling is actually something that Mark Spector set up. So all the messages might have been actually going to Mark Spector instead. The whole thing with the French poem that he believes is his favorite, but is actually Layla's favorite, is probably just his memories as Mark Spector bleeding into Stephen Grant's memories, and Stephen Grant just falsely believing that it was his favorite. No, 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 it was my favorite. And I think part of the idea with her talking about all this Egyptian history is that there are things that Stephen Grant will have learned that Mark Spector doesn't know, and that'll be part of the reason why they keep both of the personalities around. Like, why wouldn't you just try to get rid of the other one? In the comics, that's because each has their own specific skills and together they form a much more capable superhero than he would otherwise be just using one of the personalities. When the police who are working for Arthur Harrow come to investigate him to take the scarab back, it shows his apartment number, number 502. That's a reference to Avengers 502, which was during the Avengers disassembled era in the comics. And some of the things that were happening in the comics are actually happening in the MCU right now as we speak during the events of Doctor Strange 2. Like during a lot of the trailer videos, you see Scarlet Witch just going completely off the rails. During that Avengers disassembled era, Doctor Strange was going around believing that something bad had happened to magic and bad things were at play. That was a reference to what Scarlet Witch was doing going off the rails during that era, which she is now doing inside the MCU Marvel Phase 4 movies. I also just did a video about why Doctor Strange is allowing all this crazy stuff with the MCU gods to take place, just because there's so much going on in the MCU right now. So I'll link that below in the description because it's kind of his job to protect this reality from those kinds of threats. All the backstory that these police pull up on him is a reference to his comic book backstory. He was a mercenary initially in the comics. The dig site was where the statue of Khonshu was, the avatar of Khonshu, where he made the deal. It sounds like what happened is, is that Arthur Harrow's men killed all these archaeologists that were at the dig site where he wound up dying, becoming the avatar of Khonshu, but they just blamed all the deaths on Mark Spector after the fact. You then see their tattoos of the scales confirming that they're part of this cult that Arthur Harrow leads for Amit. They take him to an area of London that their group controls. It's just another very Hail Hydra type of moment, like all types of people from society belong to our group. We're secretly among you and you don't realize it. Arthur Harrow then learns the truth about what's going on with his multiple personalities and explains to him the truth of the matter. The reason why all these weird things are happening to you, the reason why you can hear Kanchu, and why I know all about him, all of his secrets, but I can't hear him or see him anymore, is because I, Arthur Harrow, used to be his avatar. He doesn't literally explain it, but he kind of implies why he decided to stop being Kanchu's avatar and become the first avatar of Amit. All the stuff that he tells Stephen Grant about Kanchu being this petulant god, acting like a child, being banished by the other gods, being a liar, never letting his body go, just having one more mission at all times, like it's always going to be one more mission, that's all true. Kanchu is not a nice god. It's just that the gods that Kanchu is fighting against during this, Amit for example, are way worse. So it's very much a devil you know kind of situation. Like, okay, Kanchu is bad, but he gives me all these powers and I can be a good superhero with them and defeat all these even worse people. It's kind of like becoming Ghost Rider in the MCU and why he works so well on this Midnight Suns type of team, this darker MCU supernatural team up because most of their patron saints or where they get their powers from are very shady sources, but they try to use those powers for good. When he references Kanchu picking him as his avatar because his mind was broken or easy to break, that's another callback to his origin in the comics, which they reference later in the episode too. Like, I always kept a barrier between us, but now because of Kanchu controlling our body, that barrier has weakened, and that's why he keeps switching so much between different personalities. When he says that Steven doesn't have to do everything that Kanchu asks him to, that's another reference to the comics where a lot of times Mark Spector will have to fight Kanchu when he asks him to do shady things that put him at odds with the other Avengers characters. When he references them learning other languages and starts speaking Mandarin, Chinese, I think that's meant to be another slight connection to what happened during the Shang-Chi movie with those characters. When Arthur Harrow starts ragging more on Kanchu, calling him this really petulant god and getting banished by the other gods, I also think a good example to make would be like early Thor in the MCU. Like Thor, God of Thunder, is one of the lesser gods in the MCU, but for a while, Odin thought that he was really irresponsible and banished him to Earth. The same kind of thing has happened between Kanchu and the other gods that are part of his pantheon. Eventually, Kanchu will probably help Moon Knight defeat Amit, and the other gods will re-accept him back into their fold. 
you get a little bit of a tutorial between the differences of Khonshu and Amit. Like, they're both gods of vengeance in the MCU, but Amit wants to go full minority report, killing everyone who will do evil, and they turn into this whole big thing about, wow, you support a group where people love killing children? You want to go around killing a bunch of children? Just to remind you how much worse their group is than what Khonshu might do. I've already explained his plan to bring Amit physically into the MCU from this other dimension. Like, he's going to find her remains using that god-tier compass, the scarab, perform a ceremony, and then sort of reinfuse her earthly remains with her spirit. To make a Star Wars reference, it's sort of like a reverse Force Ghost situation. If you could somehow stuff a Force Ghost back into the bones of the former Jedi Master that they used to be, Layla shows up to help him, and we actually get to see what it looks like when Arthur Harrow is using the artifacts of Amit as her avatar to bring the jackals into this world. Eventually, enough people start yelling in his ear that Stephen Grant gets pushed out the window, unconsciously winds up changing into the suit. But like I explained, the reason why it becomes the Mr. Knight version of the suit is because he's still in Stephen Grant form, and the way they're explaining it in the MCU is a little bit different from the comics, and they're just saying that it's because the way Stephen Grant's mind thinks, this is what a suit is supposed to look like, as opposed to Mark Spector, who knows what the actual Moon Knight costume is supposed to look like. But for the most part, they both have access to weapons, they both have the exact same powers. They have this funny moment where he talks to himself as Mark Spector, like, what are we wearing? We look like Colonel Sanders, making a Kentucky Fried Chicken reference. I've already explained why the other regular characters from the MCU can't see these creations of the gods, why they look invisible. When he gets pushed up against the bus, you see a big GRC ad, which is a reference to Falcon and Winter Soldier and other current stuff during Marvel Phase 4. The GRC is the Global Repatriation Committee, and they're sort of like this sinister group in the MCU that's formed by all the world governments after the blip to send all the people who weren't snapped back to the countries that they originally came from. This is also the second time that he's consciously switched between different personalities, giving Mark Spector control of the body. It's just more of the show deepening the connection between the different personalities. In the comics, this is a very common thing, with the different personalities actually working with each other. They also explain what happens to things that come from this pocket dimension from the gods. When he kills something from their reality, it just fades into nothingness. They explain the scarab fell off of him during the fight. Arthur Harrow got it. The reason why this is meant to be a super creepy scene is because he isn't killing the homeless man because he hates homeless people. He's like, okay, it's totally fine that you're homeless. He winds up sucking his soul because apparently the person did something bad in his past or he will do something bad. In most of this last part of the episode, it's just clarifying some of the details and what's been going on in his life this whole time, where the Stephen Grant persona came from, and why Mark Spector has been doing things this way since becoming Moon Knight. When he says he's been quote unquote doing this for a long time, it's more of a reference to his multiple personalities having secretly been a thing for most of his life. And previously, he'd just been keeping them completely separate with this big mental barrier that he directed. When he says the barrier was weakened when he lost control of his body and someone else started taking control of it, he's talking about Kanchu himself because Kanchu then literally shows up and says, whose body do you think this is? It's my body. He reiterates that if Mark Spector dies or something happens to him or they end their agreement, he will go after Layla as his next avatar and he's trying to do everything he can to protect Layla. Like I said, this is the first time we've also seen Mark Spector being the one in the real world talking to Stephen Grant in his head but using the reflection of the mirror, which is why he stomps on it later because he just wants to get him to go away. Then at the end of the episode, there's another time jump as he wakes up in Egypt, like the show's going back to Egypt because Arthur Harrow is looking for Amit's remains, which would be in Egypt and he has the scarab. But during episode 3, obviously we'll learn more about his backstory, his adventures with Layla, the event that caused him to become Moon Knight to make the bargain with Khonshu, and more of what's going to be happening in present day, with Amit trying to come back into the MCU. Also, all the exposition at the end of the episode happening at this Triangle Pyramid Monument is another reference to the history on the show and taking things back to Egypt, because they literally go back to Egypt next. But if you spotted any other Easter eggs in the episode that I didn't mention in the video, just write them below in the comments. In my new Doctor Strange 2 trailer video, we'll post next, and then I'll post more Moon Knight bonus videos. My full Moon Knight episode 3 video will post next week just like normal. Everyone click here for my new Doctor Strange trailer video. I'll update the link as soon as I post it, and click here for all my Moon Knight episode videos. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.